What's up guys, Hello Football Talk here. With the majority of NFL training camps starting in about a week and depth charts starting to be formed, I want to highlight some of the more intriguing battles for mostly starting positions and certain roles around the league. I tried to address every position at least once and cover a bunch of teams so you'll only see a couple of repeat mentions. For each group I listed a spot that is up for grabs and the likely candidates in contention not rallying off the names by likelihood, but rather who is already on the roster, and in free agency, and potentially the draft, kind of in that order. I explain all of the situations, how the players may have been acquired, and what contracts they're on, before I talk about how I think those battles will play out. Timestamps for each of these camp battles are in the video description if you want to spoil the fun, but also just if you want to look for a few that you're particularly intrigued by. So now let's dive right into the list, starting with the Steelers starting quarterback job, which I think comes down to two names, Mitchell Trubisky and Kenny Pickett. And don't you dare say the name Mason Rudolph, since they didn't even want to pay him as the number three quarterback, which is why they drafted South Dakota State's Chris Oladokun in the seventh round, who was a promising player himself and could be fun backer for them for years. Trubisky was the number two overall pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, infamously ahead of guys like Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. He did get elevated to the Pro Bowl in his second season, and the Bears looked like a real playoff contender for a couple of years there before he ultimately got benched for Nick Foles and saw his 50 option declined. Last year he backed up Josh Allen in Buffalo at a small contract number, but didn't press in very limited action and people around the organization were raving about him, making him one of those hot names of this otherwise very underwhelming free agency class of quarterbacks, which this offseason was much more about uh, big time trades being pulled off. And he ultimately signed a two year $14.5 million contract with the Steelers. The other guy is Pittsburgh's own Kenny Pickett, who he still won after with the 20th overall pick in this year's draft, as probably the one team closest connected to the quarterback class. Although I and many other people thought Liberty's Malik Willis was the guy that they had their eyes on. Instead, they went with the guy who walked into the door just a few feet away from the Steelers' entrance to the training facility for five years there. Pickett was looked at as a mid to late round pick ahead of the 2021 season, before he ascended to the ACC Offensive Player of the Year and Heisman finalist, with 47 total touchdowns compared to only seven interceptions and he ended up being the only quarterback to hear his name called over the course of the first two rounds of the draft. Trubisky of course has the upper hand in pro experience, with 50 career starts in Chicago, and going 29-21 across those, with a winning record in all but his rookie season, being responsible for 73 total touchdowns versus 38 interceptions, in terms of the ability to make big time throws, also partially out of structure, and what he can bring in the designed and improvisational run game, there's always been a lot to like with him, it's just about the lack of maturity in terms of decision making and just being able to process information from the defense to understand where to place the football. Pickett is pretty advanced in that regard for a player transitioning to the pros already, I would say, even though the light really went down for him this past season. The way he operates and how he handles himself are all very much how you want him to be from a quarterback, while having good general accuracy, being an excellent on-the-move thrower, and being able to punish defenses when he takes off himself as well, picking up ground more quickly than you'd anticipate. Than his often discussed minuscule hands, my big issues with him are how his mechanics and game altogether break down when there's any color flashing up the middle, where he leaves clean pockets and doesn't hang in there to deliver the ball, and in Halovich moments, where we saw a few head scratching actions late in games. Right now, I believe Trubisky has the upper hand here because, by all accounts, he showed a lot of growth in Buffalo last season working on the Brian Day ball, and while the experience itself is a plus for him, he has shown the ability to play winning football with a great defense and some skill position players he could count on. The offensive line in Pittsburgh is still a question mark, but they do have plenty of talent around him. With that being said, I would not be shocked to see Pickett out there week one, and with the focus on getting the rookie out there, I expect him to see extended action. Unless there's a situation where Mike Tomlin has to write the hot hand here. My guess today is a pretty even split of eight or nine games for either one of these guys. Although once again, if Pickett isn't comfortable in the pocket, that's worrisome to me. Other quarterback battles to keep your eyes on the Falcons, Marcus Mariota, another former number two overall pick, now on his third team already after flashing his back in Las Vegas, versus the second quarterback of the board in the draft in Desmond Ritter from Cincinnati, who I thought was as pro ready as anybody in this class, and I had him pretty much neck and neck uh, with Kenny Pickett actually slightly ahead of him. He does have some exciting talents, but needs to work on his consistency and accuracy. Then we've got the Panthers, and I actually had to re-record this bit because they traded for Baker Mayfield from Cleveland just a couple of hours after I finished up initially recording this. So now you obviously have Baker and Sam Donald there, the first and third overall pick from the 2018 draft. 
and you kind of feel bad for both these guys because Donald would not be playing finally began the somewhat confident offensive line while Baker certainly got screwed by the Browns and they're both kind of trying to rewrite the stories now in new places with Baker being certainly the more established player which pushes back Matt Corral the final quarterback from the two of the draft I thought had a case to potentially go at the end of the first round because of the talent that he has but now gets time to marinate and just learn an NFL dropback offense because at Ole Miss it was also RPO centric and finally the Seahawks with Geno Smith and Drew Locke who both are former second round picks and have played well for a few games and stretches but never been able to establish themselves as franchise starters now looking to step into the giant shoes left behind by Russell Wilson and originally I talked about uh, the dynamic with the Seahawks potentially looking at Baker Mayfield that's not obviously off the table and this should be a clear two-man race unless Jacob Eason can finally reinvigorate himself back in the Pacific Northwest as a former Washington quarterback but speaking of Seattle I want to talk about the Seahawks primary running back where there's really three names in contention here with Rashad Penny, Kenneth Walker III and Chris Carson and this is a bit of a tricky one because we don't know if a lot of one of these three names will actually play the season or at all anymore for that matter but i'll get to that in a little bit in terms of what we last saw from this team rashad penny seems like the easiest answer here they drafted him in the first round of 2018 coming off a monstrous senior campaign at san diego state but he only carried the ball more than 10 times once in his rookie season due to the emergence of a seventh round of him a year prior in chris carson while the flashes have been there when given the opportunity He's played in less than half the games over the last few years, thanks to multiple knee and hamstring injuries. However, this guy was absolutely on fire over the final five weeks of last season, rushing for 671 yards and six touchdowns over that stretch. In terms of the explosiveness that he brings to the table at 220 pounds, being able to blow through the line of scrimmage and run for arm tackles, this guy can be a locomotive heading downhill. While the Seahawks certainly liked what they saw from Penny recently and brought him back on a one-year deal for nearly $6 million, after initially declining his 50 option, they did also use one of the early second round picks this year on one of the most exciting running backs we saw in college football last year. Michigan State's Kenny Walker, as he now wants to be referred to as, turned himself into a weekly big play machine after transferring over from Wake Forest, where he was mostly a rotational piece, rushing for over 1,600 yards and 18 touchdowns in 12 games last year, whilst averaging 6.2 yards per pop. His burst to win around the corner, the quick feet to navigate around traffic, the way he can string together moves naturally on the fly and that extra year that he brings to the table made him one of the top two backs in this class for the majority of people. His experience in the past game is very limited and while Penny is rather unproven still as well in that regard, he at least is familiar with NFL protection schemes and returns into offensive coordinator Sean Waldron's system which is built on principles from the old Sean McVay playbook with a lot of outside and split zone. The FC Penny does have the slight edge in terms of how quickly he'll get back up to speed injuries put aside but I personally believe in Walker having the talent to make this a true one to punch fairly early and whether it takes the veteran getting banged up again or just natural selection sorting out the splits I see those actually favoring the rookie by the end of the season he just has a little more wiggle and ability to make people miss in my opinion which is also favorable uh, for just staying on the football field the interesting part here will be if either one of those guys can emerge for the primary third down role with absurdly low receiving totals for both of them as Penny has only caught 23 passes in his four years as a pro and Walker left college as a junior with just 19 receptions so names like DJ Dallas and Travis Homer are in contention for passing down work to complicate things a little bit here the most complete and accomplished of the bunch remains Chris Carson who was extremely productive and effective for the Hawks across the two and a half year stretch but he got banged up in 2020 and missed almost all of last season with a neck injury that still leaves us unclear on if he may ever come back listening to some of the comments by Pete Carroll and company. Other running back battles to keep your eyes on, the early down option for the Falcons, where Cordero Patterson was highly effective as this flex player at wide receiver and running back last season. You got Damian Williams, who was a Super Bowl hero just two and a half years ago, but then set out the 2020 campaign due to uh, COVID concerns and was very limited in Chicago last season due to getting banged up. Then Quadri Olison, who's now entering year four, but has missed more than half of the games in Atlanta as more of this bruising type of runner and then fourth from Ricky Tyler Algier from BYU who is my personal favorite because he has that ability to um, just build up speed and be able to use that momentum to gain yards for contact but while the numbers may not say it when you look at the 40 yard dash he has those breakaway runs regularly in college against some pretty good competition so I think so I think the time that he may clock is not quite what he runs in actual pads 
Similarly for Washington with Antonio Gibson as a more dynamic space player, we want to see the ball in his hands uh, with room to work, whereas the third round pick, uh, Brian Robinson Jr. from Alabama, who's more of a natural runner between the tackles, brings a tough and pass protection and rumbling downhill as somebody who has plus vision and that ability if you're given the ball in early downs to get positive yardage consistently. So that's going to be interesting to watch. The number two running back behind Josh Jacobs in Las Vegas. But Kenya Drake is more of a receiving option. Four front pick with Samir White from Georgia is more of a hammer to take pounding off the starter. Or Brandon Bolden is sort of the combination between the two and has been a solid piece of the rotation in New England. And of course in Buffalo, where another late second round pick from Georgia and James Cook is looking to establish himself as an integral piece of a pass oriented attack with the dynamic skill set that he brings, but having the veteran duo of Devin Singletary and Zach Moss still in the house. But let's now move on to the receiver position, and in particular the Dallas Cowboys number three option, where the key competitors here are James Washington, Jalen Tolbert, and Noah Brown. This is a pretty interesting one to me as well, because the Cowboys decided to trade Amari Cooper to Cleveland, and now need the third receiver to emerge for them, along with CeeDee Lamb and Michael Gallup. However, I've talked about how I felt like they ensured themselves more so against losing Gallup, in terms of the types that they brought in this offseason, as all three of the guys that I mentioned here are more so perimeter options, who do their best work down the field and can win through contact. The first is James Washington, a former second round pick for Pittsburgh, who earned the Bulletin Cup Award for the top wide receiver in the country, working with quarterback Mason Rule of Oklahoma State, who was selected by the same team just 16 picks later. Yet even when they were on the field together for Pittsburgh, they couldn't quite recreate that same kind of magic. His best statistical season by far came in 2019, when Rudolph was the primary quarterback due to an injured Big Ben, but while Washington was able to rack up 735 yards that year, he didn't even crack 900 across the other three. While they did use him on some crossers and he was one of the premier vertical playmakers in college, down the field he typically wins with his ability to position his body and haul him passes with a defender on him, despite only being 5'11". Being able to create separation consistently as a route runner has been the issue for him. He's now on a one-year $1.2 million deal. Jalen Tolbert is up next. Dallas was able to snatch him up with the 80th overall pick, even though I thought he had a chance to sneak into the late second round. He was one of the nation's most productive receivers at South Alabama, combining for well over 2,500 yards he gets up to speed quickly and uses his hands well to avoid being disrupted in his releases, while having some veteran savvy to him already to create that separation late. He doesn't have that one trump card in terms of blazing speed or elusive moves once the ball is in his hands, but if he works on his focus of addressing the football, the way he can set up his routes and how concentrated he is at tracking the ball down the field, he could quickly become a productive target. And thirdly we have Noah Brown, the least sexy one of these names, but he has been on the roster for 4 years now. For the work he's done on special teams mostly, and he did do pretty well with his 49 targets these last two years combined, dropping only one of those and hauling in 30 for 338 yards. He's not a big play machine or anything like that, but he at least has experience in Calamo's system. Ultimately, I believe Tolbert will be the one most regularly deployed as an X or Z for them, because he's the most talented one of the three and can win in more ways. Washington will have his role and will come up with a few of those big time grabs when needed. But while I do believe the passing attack will be very CD centric in terms of having those two outside receivers and more of a vertical plane to create space between the numbers, the rookie may give them more versatility schematically, while Brown services on teams I will mainly earn him that one year deal at basically the exact same price point as Washington. If Gallup misses a few games recovering from a torn ACL, that opens up more opportunities though for any of these three guys to get those targets and be productive with those. And while I did want to focus on one team for each position, with how many free and four wide receiver sets we see around the league being run, the distinction we made for Dallas looking for more of an outside receiver, I want to talk about the Bills options in the slot, where you're looking at Isaiah McKenzie, Jamison Crowder and Khalil Shakir uh, competing for snaps. I've actually finished most of my next big written piece on the biggest breakout candidates among second and third year players for 2022, and you can expect playoff hero Gabriel Davis to make an appearance on there who will see a certain role on the inside along with Stephon Diggs, as Buffalo and Brian Dayball did move their receivers around quite a bit, and I expect it to remain under the recently elevated offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey. However, in terms of the true slot receiver and the base 11 personnel packages, left behind by the departure of Cole Beasley, I think a snap and target share for that guy is still very much up in the air, with three intriguing candidates battling it out. Isaiah McKenzie is the one returning piece among that trio, while the measurements are pretty similar to Beasley, when the Bills moved this guy into the starting lineup, 
His usage was much more reliant on the speed, not just down the field, but also working across it. That week's against the Patriots comes to mind, where Buffalo was running speed concepts over and over again, where he'd have two receivers crossing deep and Josh Allen's ability to extend plays and drop some absolute dimes. Nothing Bill Belichick and company tried to do would work. McKenzie hauled in 11 passes for 125 yards that day. However, he only caught 9 passes for 53 yards the rest of the regular season combined for his lowest total in 4 years with Buffalo, as he mainly made his mark as a return specialist there. That's what they brought him back for 2 more years at $4.5 million, along with potentially uh, an extended role on offense. Jameson Crowder is much more in the mold of the smaller, crafty slot receivers, which these days is actually more of a dying breed if you follow recent trends. This past season, he played the lowest amount of snaps and has the lowest per game numbers in his 7 year career, but still was a fairly effective player for one of the worst offenses in the league with the driven rival Jets. The guy has quietly caught more than 400 passes for over 4600 yards in his NFL career, thanks to his ability to settle down in wide areas or work his way open with a tremendous feel for route pacing and body language. At this point, he may run in the high for sixes, but he's a very reliable option who can help them move the chains with option and pivot routes. That's why they are paying him 2 million bucks this year. And finally, we have the 5th round pick Khalil Shakir from Boise State, where I've called one of the biggest steals in the draft on multiple occasions now. I've said this every time, but he has some keen Allen qualities to him, with the way that he can be deceptive in his approach and set up defenders with unorthodox step sequencing. He did have a few focus drops last season, but he also made a few crazy full extension grabs. I think you can put him at Z and be more flexible with the rest of the receiving corp in terms of alignments. Once again, he doesn't present the speed dimension of a McKenzie, for example, but once the ball is in his hands, he can hit another gear. He's obviously still a rookie, but I love his game. So this is a tough one, because all three of these guys have a legitimate case for the Manning snaps and should all see some action. If I had to imagine a path here, I'd say Crowder starts in a slot, because it makes sense in terms of Gabe Davis being more of a vertical playmaker on the perimeter, Dick's being really good in the intermediate areas, and the way he can work space underneath. But I personally think Shakir has to find his way onto the football field. It may not be right away, but I want to put the Haloso Football Talk stamp on him to become a pretty integral piece to that offense over the second half of the season because of the way that they can change the picture shortly before the snap with him and not be static. McKenzie will have his couple of games where they use him as a man beater on rubs and constantly take advantage of him catching the ball on the move, but he remains a return ace firstly. Some other wide receiver battles I'll be tracking, the Panthers Z receiver, where they're probably looking for last year's second round Terrace Marshall Jr. from LSU to emerge. They also brought in Rashad Higgins, who was also an effective outside target, and did line up at X quite a bit in the absence of Odell Beckham Jr. for Cleveland. And they also had a Miami's Charleston Rambo as an unrated free agent, who is a pretty skilled player, even if his speed may be limited. The Seahawks number 3 receiver, when they run 11 personnel to pair up with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. I still have high hopes for Dwayne Eskridge, their second round pick from Western Michigan last year, who had issues finding a way onto the field, but has the big playability inside of him. Freddie Swain has been a solid player for them when called upon. Marcus Goodwin, the former 49 at Bear, who has always been more of a designated deep threat and return specialist. And finally this year's 7th rounder, Bo Melton, who can keep defenders off balance with his unique route running and has a knack for getting yards after the catch with how elusive he is in space. And then the Patriots' entire receiving corp is kind of in flux right now, I would say. Kendrick Bourne was a very productive player for them last season. It's more of a typical axe. They also did trade for Devontae Park from Miami in a similar mold though, and he gives them that jump ball presence. Jacoby Myers always finds ways to get open out of the slot, even though he doesn't blow you away with any physical features. And then second round pick Tycoon Fordon from Baylor is looking to become what Nelson Aguilar wasn't able to be for them last year, with the ghost of former first round pick Nikhil Harry still in the building. But next up we got the Giants starting tight end position, being decided between Ricky Seals Jones, Jordan Aikens and Daniel Ballinger. We've talked about a lot of situations where the teams are pretty happy about the dilemma they are facing of having to find the best option for one of those jobs. This one is a bit different because I don't think any of these three guys are necessarily who you want as the primary options heading into the season. With the departure of Evan Ingram, this leaves a void for somebody to step up in an offense under Brian Dable that saw Dawson Knox become a pretty well known name in Buffalo. Ricky Seals Jones is the most traveled among them, now in his 5th team in 6 years. He's only played more than 28% of snaps in 2 of those seasons, combining for a little over 600 yards across 28 games. He certainly had a few nice performances while stepping in as the backup most recently in Washington, but he's never been the primary option heading into a season. 
Seals Jones is a big target who can win down the seams, high point the football with a defender on him, and becomes a solid load to bring down with the ball in his hands. He's not consistent enough through contact, and he's much better flexed out wide than as an inline asset, but in terms of a pure receiver, he's a solid piece for them. Jordan Aikens has actually slightly outproduced the form in his four years with Houston. I was really shocked to see the former third round pick being three years older than Seals Jones and already having cracked that 30 mark, because his game is also more so the one of a younger player, with a lot of his best plays coming based on the outs after the catch. He's a long strider who can fight off would-be tacklers and produce positive yardage on those underneath touches. That's why the Texans used him quite a bit as an H-back, slipping underneath the formation and peeling off into the flats. He hasn't really proven himself as a more intricate route runner or somebody who can make an impact in line in the run game, but he does have the ability to make big grabs working down hashes. The third name here is one of the fourth rounders in Daniel Bellinger from San Diego State, a university that has come up more than anticipated already. Not a crazy athlete, but actually tested in the top third in all combined events other than the 20 yard shuttle for the position. I think he generally has the best chance of being the one complete guy at that spot for Big Blue, because whether it's creating vertical push and combos with the tackle or pinning edge defenders inside to allow the ball to get it wide, he can help them get their run game going with Saquon Barkley coming back. He shows good burst off the line in the pattern, he's a very reliable hands catcher with zero drops as a senior, and he consistently extends forward for extra yardage. So really I think this one is one of those rare situations where fourth rounder has a good chance of being in the starting lineup with one. Rick Seals Jones is probably the slight favorite simply because he's plenty of experience releasing as a true Y, splitting up Y and stuff like that for the evil system, while Akins is more of the H or F option of the ball when they do get into 12 personnel. Still, Ballinger to me could easily become the preferred option in one tight end sets because he can get the job done in a run or pass game for a team that likely won't get into many heavy groupings other than in the goal line short yardage situations. The two veterans are there for just this season at slightly above a million dollars each. A couple of other Titans battles to watch. The Jets are the one that really jumps out to me because they completely overhauled that room, with ZG Osoma having been an underrated player for Cincinnati for a few years now. Tal Conklin had 600 yards in Minnesota last season when given the chance, as Irv Smith Jr. got hurt early on. And then third round pick Jeremy Ruckett has the ability to be the most complete of the bunch and should see the field early due to his tenacity as a blocker. The Dolphins probably aren't selling the number two tight ends with Durham Smythe, Hans Long and Adam Shaheen in contention for that role. With Long is my favorite because he brings the best size and blocking combination. And then the Chargers, I'm not 100% settled on Jared Everett being their starting tight end because he's not super reliable, even if he's the most dangerous with the ball in his hands. But Donald Parham can give them serious size at that spot as more of a detached target. And they did draft Trey McKinney in the third round last year even though he's largely used as a blocker in year one, and that's his area of expertise. But now let's get to the offensive line. Uh, first, we have the Buccaneers left guard, where you got uh, Aaron Stinney, Robert Hainsey, and Luke Gady Key competing for that spot. Looking at the Bucs line, the lineup is pretty stacked at four of those five spots. While the unretirement of Tom Brady that sent the Ryan Jensen back to the organization, the sudden retirement of another pro bowler and guard Ali Mappet, and Alex Kappa signing a pretty lucrative contract in Cincinnati, created holes to either side of Jensen. General manager Jason Light was able to pull off a shrewd deal in one of the most lopsided trades I've seen in a while, acquiring Shaq Mason from the Patriots for just a fifth round pick, and he should actually be an upgraded right guard, but the voided spot on the left now creates a Freeman competition for that final spot. Aaron Stinney appears to be the easiest answer here, since while my pets did play about 88% of snaps last season, Stinney was the primary backup for that spot, and started every game from the division round on the year prior during the Super Bowl run. Nick Leverett did end up playing nearly a full game when he got hurt last season, but got his ass kicked by the Colts in that one, and only was on the field for three other snaps all year long. Stinney does come in the mold of a rugged gap scheme mauler in terms of being able to create vertical push on the inside zone and do combos, but he's not the best at mirroring interior pass rushers laterally, and allows those guys to get to the edges of his frame too regularly. That's why he's back for another prove it year at 1.4 million bucks. Robert Hainsey was a top 100 pick for them in last year's draft, officially listed as a tackle, which did play on the right side for Notre Dame. Many people projected him to move inside, potential to the center spot because he has suboptimal length to play on the edge, but does feature nice movement skills. With the Bucks' two starting tackles missing less than 50 combined snaps, and Josh Wells being there as the veteran swing option, Hainsey was only on the field for 31 total offensive snaps as a rookie. He's sort of in competition for the backup tackle role, but I would expect him to have a better chance almost for playing time inside, 
The reason I like that move last year was the flexibility that this guy brings to the table. He'll give you quality snaps at potentially all five spots across the front. That's also why I like the second round that they picked up this April in Central Michigan's Luke Gedeke, who also spent his collegiate career, at least those two full seasons that he had with the Chippewas, at right tackle, and at least put up equally good tape as the guy on the other end in Bernard Ryman, who shockingly ended up going around later than his former teammate. Gedeke has some similar limitations in terms of coming in slightly below the 33 inch mark for arm length and maybe not having the quickest feet, but he has a ton of grip strength to control reps in either facet of the game with a knack for throwing guys to the ground once he gets slightly off balance and as somebody who accelerates his feet through contact in the run game to displace defenders. That's what makes this fun because all three of these guys are legitimate cases to start for a team, but they're part of one of the premier offensive lines in football and there's only one job available to them. I would think Stinney has a leg up as of today, because even though he may have been the weaker piece among that unit, he did fail solidly during the championship run and was brought back to see what he can do for an extended stretch probably. However, I believe KDK is the one they want to plug in ultimately, and right now I'd guess they'll end up starting about the same amount of games. That's not saying they don't believe in Hainsey, but with no secondary natural center on the roster, I believe they'll focus on that spot with him and want to maintain the flexibility to put him where he's needed in case of injury. As far as this position group goes, there's a lot of battles that I don't want to get into detail about, but both guard spots for the 49ers are still to be earned, with several mid-round picks competing for them. The Giants left guard situation with Shane Lemieux, Max Garcia, Jamil Douglas, and third round pick Joshua Zudu from North Carolina having their names in the ring. The Colts right guard spot, with Danny Pinta and Matt Pryor having seen action in case of injury, Will Fries is a late round pick a couple of years ago, and maybe even Dennis Kelly, who's primarily a backup for those two offensive tackle spots, I would think. And that third guy on the Bears interior offensive line, along with Cody White's hands, I must have most likely. Finally, as far as offensive players go, I want to talk about the Ravens right tackle situation, where you're looking at three names in Juwan James, Morgan Moses, and Daniel Falele. The Ravens offensive line performed way below the usual standards last season, due to multiple factors. Not only did they lose their all-pro left tackle Ronnie Stanley in the season opener, shifting the plans on the right side as well, as Alejandro Villanueva had to flip sides, they brought in Patrick McCarry at right tackle, and had a rotating wheel at left guard. They also transitioned much further towards the pass game, not playing with the lead as much and having the back of quarterback in the game. And finally, being without the top three running backs heading into preseason, the decreased rushing threat that they presented made opponents comfortable with blitzing and playing man more frequently, putting a lot of stress on their unit to excel in communication and handle their assignments, while the receiving corp had issues getting open in time. With Stanley back, one of the best center prospects in years with Tyler Lindbaum from Iowa being there now, and more options at right tackle, the group should look a lot better in 2022, but that one spot I just mentioned is still up for grabs. With Patrick McCarty likely being deployed inside again this season, Jawan James was actually the only true offensive tackle on the roster, other than Stanley heading into the offseason. However, this guy hasn't played a snap in Baltimore so far. In fact, he hasn't played in an actual game since December of 2019 with the Broncos. That was his first season in Denver after signing a hefty four-year deal as a former stand-up performer for the Dolphins. Unfortunately, he was limited just three games that year, and after opting out of the 2020 season due to COVID, he tore his Achilles in offside workouts, leading to him being cut and filing grievances against the Broncos organization. The Ravens decided to bring him in on just a two-year deal worth $9 million bucks, and after spending a year on the non-football injury list, he may finally be able to get back to his Miami form, where he was one of the premium pass protectors at that spot. Morgan Moses was the other bargain for agency that general manager Eric DaCosta made this year, signing one of the most underrated starters in the league to a three-year, $50 million contract. Very much unlike James, Moses hasn't missed a single game since his rookie campaign in 2014, and the only contest he didn't start was in last year's season opener with the Jets, after he was shockingly released by Washington. He's been one of the most consistent guys around in terms of his grading by multiple services, consistently being able to cover up bodies and creating running room on largely zone-based rushing schemes, while surrendering more than four sacks in just one of those seven seasons as a starter. However, when the Ravens were on the clock with the first of their six fourth-round picks in this year's draft, and the massive Minnesota tackle Daniel Falele was still on the board, they simply couldn't resist. The born Aussie is one of the most enormous human beings you will ever find anywhere on the planet, but especially in the football field, with much better movement skills than you're supposed to have. Very much similar to what now pro bowler and fellow Aussie Drop Malada was coming in for the Eagles. I want to see Falele get off the ball with better urgency, and use his natural force as a run blocker more regularly. While his technique in pass pro still in his refinement, 
but his wide frame and long arms afford him plenty of room for error. In terms of where all of these players are as of today, I think Moses has the cleanest path here of the bunch in terms of the proven track record and half status. It's just so tough to judge where James is because he hasn't seen any regular action for a good two and a half years now, but he did look like one of the top right tackles in football when we last laid eyes on him. Falele to me has a chance to be the long-term future solution for them, very much in the style of what he had in Orlando Brown Jr. I believe rigorous coaching will be needed to get the best out of him, having started his football journey just months before James even was playing his most recent game, but this is a good problem to have for them I believe. Since I already mentioned them, the Broncos right tackle spot is one that hasn't been solved for years, since Jawan James ended up not being the answer there. Billy Turner seems to be the most likely candidate, but Tom Compton actually graded fairly well for San Francisco last year, and Calvin Anderson will at least be back in Denver for his fourth season, after being brought back on a one-year extension in each of the last two years. And as I mentioned when discussing the biggest roster holes for each NFL team, which that video on the AFC should pop up at the end of this one, and you can obviously find it on my channel, the Chargers left guard or right tackle spots, depending on where they end up putting Matt Filer, could be a major weakness if none of those guys they have there can take a big step forward. Which has us switching over to the defensive side of the But first up with the 49ers Leo defensive end, with Samson Abicom, Kimoko Ture, Drake Jackson, and in brackets here at D Ford. As you can see, the fourth name here but in brackets, because Ford doesn't even feel like he's on the roster anymore. With Juwan Kinlaw coming back from injury, along with Nick Bose and Eric Armstead, the 49ers could have three stud first rounders on the defensive line, but at fourth spot, I believe he's still wide open, at least in terms of starters, which largely is referred to as the Leo, meaning the weak set defensive end, with Bosa mostly lining up on the tight end side of base downs. Let's just quickly address D Ford here. He was the big trade addition in 2019 prior to drafting soon to be defensive rookie of the year Nick Bosa, who's become, to me, one of the top three defensive ends overall in the NFL, as they got Ford from Kansas City for a second round pick, and they gave him a five year, $85.5 million contract. While he did have some moments that year, he has not nearly lived up to that billing and only played 152 total snaps over the last two years combined. With them restructuring his deal to wipe the rest of his salary in the future, he's a likely candidate to be cut this offseason still. So the prime candidate to maintain that spot from last year is Samson Abicom, who finished behind only both in the Armstead with 51% of the snaps on the defensive line, reaching exactly 4.5 sacks for the first straight season along with 5 tackles of a loss and 11 additional quarterback hits. While never having been a star for the Rams either, he's always been an underrated piece with great activity level, working his way around blockers to create disruption in the run game, and being able to rush from different alignments, as he regularly took more direct paths, crashing inside on twists or condensing the edge. He's in the second and finally of his $12 million contract with the gold rush. Kamoko Ture was brought in as a free agent this offseason on a 1 year $1.7 million deal, to sort of take the place of Arden Key as more of the speed threat of the edge, who can dip underneath tackles and force quarterbacks to step up into the rest of the rush. The former Colts second rounder could never quite live up to his potential in Indy, largely due to injury, but he did put up a career high 5.5 sacks and 5 tackles for loss this past season. In the run game he's at his best slanting inside of tight ends and creating chaos, but in passing downs he most resembles what they had early on in D Ford as a speed rush specialist, who packs a pretty nice spin move along with it. And finally, the guy that I'm most excited about, this year's second round of Drake Jackson from USC. This guy was looked at as an eventual top 10 pick coming off his freshman season and even impressed in the COVID Jordan 2020 campaign. Someone who fell from grace as a junior despite reaching 8 tackles for loss and quietly racking up 26 total pressures on just 182 pass rush snaps. In terms of a disciplined early down run defender, he's not quite what you're looking for necessarily, being prone to one in trouble inside of blocks regularly and stuff like that. But this dude can bend around the edge like only a few guys that I've ever seen, which he pairs up with a sudden rip move, and with his fluidity, he could become a nightmare on stunts in all the games that San Francisco wants to run in longer downs. Even our defensive coordinator, Demico Ryans, deployed his defensive lineman last season. Even Bosa and Armstead only played about three quarters of the snaps, and they rotated the hell out of the rest of that group, with relief in the philosophy of keeping those bodies fresh. So no matter who emerges, I expect 50% of snaps to be the absolute limit, I think Abicom has the upper hand in this fight in terms of who actually locks those starts, but I could absolutely see Ture come close to Arden Key's third of the snaps that he got, and I believe Waldrick Jackson will play a very limited role in early downs. His usage from always passing downs will continue to rise as he begins to magnify the talent that he provides. 
if the Niners make it back to the playoffs, which is largely dependent on your belief in Trey Lance at quarterback in the second season, Jackson may be the one to deliver some key hits on the quarterback we need the most. A defensive end or edge defender battles that I'll be keeping my eyes on, the Bengals for defensive end spots, particularly when they slide one of those two stars inside an obvious passing downs, where they have Joseph Osai and Cameron Sample from last year's draft, Khalid Kareem and White Hubert from the year prior. All have seen some play, but none of them have really established themselves quite yet, with Sample and Kareem presenting more of those flexible body types as well, who can rush inside and out on passing downs. If the CX transition to more odd front stuff under Khalid Hurt, with the influence of uh, Sean Desai, who will be the starting Sam linebacker, the free agency addition of former Charger Uchen Nwosu, who was one of the more underrated players for a while, or the promising second round pick Boy Mouth from Minnesota. And I do already have a favorite in this one, which I'll get to in the defensive edition of a breakout candidate right up. But in terms of snap share, that second outside linebacker kick for the Rams, where Justin Hollins and Terrell Lewis are battling for, where Justin Hollins and Terrell Lewis are battling for work, on the opposite end of Leonard Floyd is still kind of up for grabs. Moving us a little bit further inside, with the Broncos fight for the starting three or four eye technique, with Deshaun Williams, McTalvin Jim, Ioma was a Rike, and Matt Hennings as the four candidates. We're starting to get a little more technical here in terms of base front alignments. So here we're referring to a defensive lineman playing on the outside edge of the guard or the inside shoulder of a tackle. Certainly not that those are the only two alignments used, but generally in the type of front that I envision for Denver, this is where I would slot the missing guy, so to speak. New defensive corner Ejiro Avero is coming over from the Rams where they ran a pretty similar system, coming from the Vic Fangio tree, which he is now taking over the pieces from the Guru himself while having brought in two underrated guys from San Francisco in free agency, with Nickelback K1 Williams and nose tackle DJ Jones. I believe the latter one moves Mike Purcell to the second string, since he's primarily an A-gap defender, while Draymond Jones can play free technique on rushdowns, but is more so a standard 5 or 6 technique I would call it in base, supporting outside linebackers Bradley Chubb as a Sam, and the one big free agency addition in Randy Gregory more on the weak side in wider alignments, the guy who can primarily play in the B-gap is still missing, since Timmy Shelby Harris a piece in the Russell Wilson trade, who was an underappreciated player for them for years. Deshaun Williams and Shamar Steffen were next in line in terms of snaps, at around 36% each, even slightly ahead of Mike Purcell, but the latter is currently still a free agent, opening up a larger role for Williams potentially. He's a guy who can stack solo blocks by guards and work his way down the line to come of late, making him a fit in more of a niche role if they want to live in those even fronts ultimately anyway. But with just one sack and tackle for loss each, he's not going to offer much as a penetration style player or pass rusher. McTalvin and Jim's snap share was significantly lower in 2021, at just above 8%. The per game splits over his first two seasons, after being a third round pick for Denver, look a lot better, at around 20% each. But he's missed half of the time and hasn't been able to produce much yet, with just one and a half sacks and one tackle for loss altogether. Going back to his college evaluation, a team clearly had his issues anchoring down against double teams, but if he allows him to get up field, he became tough to handle because of his quick first step and the wild hands that he brought to the table. To draft and then draft picks from this year in fourth round, that Iuma was a Rike from Iowa State and sixth round pick Matt Hanson from Wisconsin. Was a Rike is a very interesting name to me because at 6'6", 310 pounds, he has the natural strength, athleticism, and length to play anywhere on the line. And while his block recognition needs work. He can play gap control, penetrate, or be a menace on stunts. Henningsen surprised a lot of people with his premier testing numbers at the Wisconsin Pro Day. I don't think that fully translates onto the field, but there's a couple of plays every game where he flashes, and he's been a worker bee for the Badgers front. He has a nose up in his fight because he has played a similar role for this team already and can help them stop the run on early downs, even if he may be routinely subbed off in passing situations. At Jim, I was probably a little too high on at Arkansas, and he has to impress the coaching staff to get any more action, while Henningsen is most of a depth piece early on as well, probably. Once again, Wasariki is the guy I have my eyes on. It may not be at this specific spot, but overall, I believe he'll finish behind only DJ and Draymond Jones in terms of total snaps played, because of the versatility and potential that he presents. The way I labeled this, it may not be the more traditional 3 4 front a whole lot anyway. But even then, considering Randy Gregory only played 55% of snaps when available in Dallas last season, putting Jones outside the tackle as an even front defensive end and having Wasserik at free technique with the ability to flip those roles makes some sense to me. Look at with muscle penetrating interior defenders. How do the Cowboys use the defensive line altogether? 
because they really only have a day three pick who I do like in Jordan Richard III. It's more of a traditional shaped nose. While there are a bunch of guys contending for B-gap snaps and they might be able to put two upfield guys on the field as much this season. While Ozo Digzua, Neville Gallimore, Tristan Hill and Carlos Watkins are all assembled them together here. The Vikings are likely switching to more of a free for base themselves where they're looking for Armon Watts, James Lynch, Otto and Twyman to kind of emerge as maybe more disruptive interior guys while having the space controllers in Dalvin Tomlinson and Harrison Phillips there already. And then finally, assuming the Browns like what they've seen from last year's day 3 pick Tommy Togiai, primarily playing in the A-gaps, free technique is a spot where they have quite a few names looking to earn playing time, with Jordan Elliott, who can slide inside as well, Tim and Brian coming over from Jacksonville, where he never lived up to his first round status, and Perrin Winfrey motivated to prove that he should not have fallen to the top of day 3 this year, because he does have a lot of talent to work with. But let's move even closer to the football, with the Bills nose tackle situation, you can call it a one technique as well in this uh, even front. So this is one of those two repeat teams here, since we already talked about the Bills slot receiver battle. And I want to discuss the nose tackle position, which I'm pretty intrigued by looking at the very different track records of these players and the roles they may play for the current Super Bowl favorites. You can argue if Ed Oliver has lived up to the billing as a top 10 draft pick, but now if this year's 50 option already picked up this off season and the consistency in his snap total, he's going to be the starting free technique. So who will Buffalo pair him up with? With Harrison Phillips and Stalo to Lele gone, we're looking at three additions in line for work. Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips, and Tim Settle. Jones is the first team up here, with by far the most experienced of the group. Having started all 109 games, he's been available for since his second season in the league with the Titans, before spending a year in Carolina last season. With 56 to 64% of snaps in each of them, he's not going to blow you away with creating negative plays but he's been extremely consistent as a space eater and player who can and has lined up anywhere from a 0 to a 5 technique. I wouldn't call him a traditional nose tackle necessarily, but having beefed up to a solid 6'4", 320 pounds, he can win the A cap as a shade nose and force ball carriers to bubble around or stop the feet momentarily, while giving you a pocket pushing presence and allowing you to set up twists with him in rushdowns. That's why he was signed for 2 years worth 40 million bucks. Jordan Phillips in Buffalo as the former second round pick for Miami, was claimed of waivers by the Bills in 2018 and put together the best season of his career the following campaign with 9.5 sacks, 13 tackles for loss and 31 total pressures. Unfortunately, like I predicted back then already, paying a guy coming off a year like that where the stats look better than the film, he didn't even come close to living up to the big contract he received from Arizona, playing in only 9 games in each of his two seasons there with underwhelming production among those before he was released heading into the final year of his contract. The Bills brought him back for a year at a $5 million price point, looking for his more upfield oriented style of play to create issues for offenses and see if he can be an asset on third downs for a team that should be playing with a lot of leads. Thirdly, Tim Sadler seen by Father Lee's play, the fifth round of Washington in 2018. I actually thought he had tremendous potential looking at his freaky movement skills at 335 pounds. He's trimmed down by about 20 pounds since then, trying to find his way onto the field for a team whose defensive line consists of four first rounders. With just two starts in four years and not having gone over a third of the defensive snaps in any of them, still going back to the 2020 season, he did have five sacks and tackles for loss each, along with seven quarterback hits. Last year, he was kind of a dog as it felt like, but in terms of somebody who can play over the center and fight across the top of blocks in the run game, while being able to walk single blockers back into the quarterback slab. There's a lot to like for a guy who only just turned 25 years old, not on a contract for two years at only 9 million bucks. Personally, I'm most excited to see what Settle can do with extended playing time, as he's already received PFF pass rush grades above 71 in each of his last two seasons. So if he buys into the Bills culture and can find some consistency under one of the better defensive line coaches than Eric Washington, I could see him play a career high in snaps. Jones' track record and ability to control the line of scrimmage on early downs would indicate he'll be Buffalo's week on starter, while Phillips will be on the field for more of the later down stuff and looking to re-emerge as an interior rusher with the flexibility to work up the B-gap as well more regularly. There's not many situations in that spot where I see true battles happening. Baltimore did draft the supremely talented guy in UConn's Travis Jones in the third round, which was surprising to me for him to last that long so he could eventually take over for the recently resigned Michael Pierce. Depending on how you want to look at the Eagles, trying to figure out how to split playing time between Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox, and now first round pick Jordan Davis from Georgia. But that's about it in terms of what comes to mind for me.
So let's move on to the second level of the defense with the battle for one of those two Dolphins inside linebacker spots where you have Landon Roberts, Duke Riley and Channing Tindall battling it out. Well, oftentimes the departure of a defensive minded head coach creates problems with trying to pinpoint which schemes will be run by that team and most of the defensive coordinator will be replaced as well. Josh Wire was retained by Miami to now work under Mike McDaniel, whose expertise is clear on the offensive side of the ball as a long-term assistant under Cal Shanahan. So while there may be little tweaks, in theory this is the same defense that we already saw from them, bringing back all 11 starters in base, nickel and dime personnel. That's pretty crazy to say for any team. With just 4 draft picks and the only really big move being a trade for Tyree Kill as an explosive weapon on offense, along with rehauling the backfield and offensive line for the most part, we have a pretty clear indication of what this defensive unit will look like. However, I believe there's one position that could still see some changes happening, because while Jerome Baker has been an underrated linebacker for them and played nearly a thousand snaps last season, that running mate on the inside for him may not be totally settled on quite yet. Landon Roberts is the obvious favorite for the job, since he was easily second in terms of off-ball linebacker snaps at 55%, which was slightly more than the next three guys had combined. The Dolphins want to bring the heat on longer passing downs anyway and rather put extra rush specialists on the field along with only DBs and true man coverage. But Roberts has been a solid player for them, being able to knife through gaps in the run game, indicated by a six tackle of loss last season and forcing three turnovers. However, he has missed 25 combined tackles over the last two years, which makes up for about 15% of his attempts and the Dolphins did bring him back for just one more year at 2.75 million bucks for now. Duke Riley was third in line with just over 20% of snaps. He's more in the mold of Baker in terms of a slightly undersized linebacker with the ability to scrape over the top of blocks and chase things down away from the point of attack, while having the movement skills to pick up guys out of the backfield, act as a spy or be a delayed add-on rusher. The former third rounder hasn't been able to stick in Atlanta or Philadelphia, but he does bring some of the qualities you'd like in the second level to clean up some of the situations that you may put yourself in by sending extra bodies and pressures. Riley will actually earn a smidge more than Roberts at a flat 3 million, probably because they value what it does for them on special teams. And Miami didn't get onto the clock until the end of day 2 of this past draft, but with the first selection, they targeted the third Georgia off-ball linebacker in Channing Tindall. He doesn't have the physicality of a Quay Walker, who was a first round pick uh, for the Packers, or tremendous instincts of a Lacobe Dean, but Tindall is the freakest of the bunch with a sub 4-5 in the 40 and the two jumps being the 95th percentile for the position. This dude can flat out run, at times passing his teammates closer to the action as a pursuit player. That also makes him a great spy and a thorn in the quarterback's eye when scheme 3 is a blitzer. With zero starts or passes defensed, his resume is lacking, but the talent is obviously there. Like I mentioned, Robert seems to be the first in line simply because of his experience in the system and what he provides against the run. Rather, I would once again expect to be more of a backer for Baker, but I think Tyndall could see plenty of action, even if it's just to complement what Roberts does on first and second down. Look at Miami's matchups with the Bills, even when they've been able to stick with Buffalo's receivers. Josh Allen has broken the back with timely scrambles on so many occasions that having that rookie with eyes on him and being able to track him down in space could be huge for them. And I could see a situation where if I had to split 100% of snaps, which if they want to put a lot of 6 DB or 4 defensive end sets on the field, likely won't happen. He would go 40 each for Roberts and Tyndall, with Riley staying at about 20%. Of other intriguing linebacker battles, I'd throw Baltimore in there once again, with veteran uh, Josh Bynes continuing to demand snaps as the mic, next to 2020 first rounder Patrick Queen. They did however also draft Malik Harrison a couple of rounds later that year, who I like as a big dude with blitzing upside, but has not been able to stay healthy for them. And then they picked up an undrafted free agent in Auburn Jacoby McLean, who plays with his hair on fire all the time and should have had his name called, I believe. The Lions' whole linebacker corp is somewhat of an enigma at this point, with like six different names in contention that I don't want to rattle off now. But once again, I want to put the Hellos with Football Talk stamp on Malcolm Rodriguez, who I think has the potential to blow away those coaches as a six round pick from Oklahoma State, thanks to the way that he processes the game and the raw city that he plays it with. And then you've got the Falcons, who still have Dion Jones in house, but with Foyer Luakun signing a big deal in Jacksonville. Now we're looking at veterans like Roshan Evans and uh, Nick Wachowski as recent signings bailing it out with a promising second year player Michael Wright who should have his role in passing downs thanks to his ability to cover ground and second round pick Troy Anderson from Montana State who has the potential to be better than all of those guys that they have there because he's an absurd athlete 
who's been all conference at running back, quarterback, outside linebacker, and inside linebacker. To the secondary, first up with the battle for the Colts number two cornerback spot, with three names that I want to bring up here in Isaiah Rogers, Brandon Faison, and Anthony Chesley. I don't know if I said it on YouTube before or if I mentioned it in one of my written pieces that I have prepared already, but there's a lot to like about the Colts to look at them potentially emerging as one of those second tier AFC teams. If there's one spot that may hold them back, it's that second outside cornerback. Stefan Gilmore figures to be the de facto number one, even if he may not travel much in defensive coordinator Gus Bradley's system. But if he does stick with more single high principles, he could at least shadow the top outside receiver. Kenny Moore has established himself as one of the elite slot defenders in the league, but that second perimeter corner job is very much up for grabs, I would think. Isaiah Rogers was the guy to fill in for Indy when Xavier Rhodes went down for them with a hamstring injury last year and he was not resigned. Rogers ended up playing 48% of snaps, which was slightly behind Rocky Sin, who was used in a direct swap for defensive end Yannick Ngakwe from Las Vegas. He didn't perform particularly poorly, but I would say his three interceptions hide the fact that he surrendered nearly 7 yards per target in coverage. He's light on his feet, has the speed to carry routes vertically, but while his luckiest team has the true giants in at receiving corp on offense, he'll have his issues covering bigger bodies at 5'10", 170 pounds, and looking back at 2020, nearly three quarters of the total snaps came on special teams as a designated return man, which is why they gave him a four year contract for primarily in 2020. Brandon Faison probably had the best tip among these three names last season, after he had spent three years as a backup with the Chargers, and then five games into 2021, had to jump in for the injured Trayvon Mullen. The Colts finally signed Faison a day after the deal with Vegas, that sent Rockers in over there for about three and a half million bucks. He did have two really bad performances against Kansas City and at Dallas, one for two of the most lethal group of cast catchers. But if you put those 200 yards and four touchdowns to the side for now, which I know is easy, but his coverage numbers otherwise look pretty damn impressive, and the film backed that up, being able to stick with guys down the sideline, turn his head to find the ball and make plays on it, leading to 13 PBUs and an interception. I thought I'd quickly mention Anthony Chesley here, because while he only did play 8% of defensive snaps last season, he was the one other guy that they actively spent money on this offseason, extending him for another year at about $900,000. Despite not being like a core special teamer, he must have impressed coaches in practice and the limited on-field time that he got in 9 games. I really think this one could go down to the wire, while Chesley was more so just a throw in here for me, because they must see something in him that they wanted to bring him back. The other two guys are pretty neck and neck I would think to start camp. Personally, I would give the slide edge to face on because he did play well outside of two games under Grass Bradley already, and at the salary that they're playing him, he was an obvious priority for them. The leash may not be very long for either guy, since I would still identify this as a weak spot for the team, but Rogers will maintain a role as a return specialist either way, while the defensive snaps may end up being anywhere from 50-50 to 2-1. You're to you also looking at corner battles in Minnesota, with Cameron Dantzler having shown signs and now battling it out with second rounder Andrew Booth Jr. and fourth rounder Caleb Evans, who their general manager openly has a crush on. Arizona, where there's an underwhelming collection of Antonio Hamilton, Breon Borders, and two late round picks in Christian Matthew and Daryl Baker Jr., trying to earn the second starting spot along with a still questionable second year guy in Marco Wilson after the tragic passing of former first rounder Jeff Gladney. Denver, as Ronald Darby is looking to live up to his contract that he signed last year, while well, I think former mid-round pick Michael Ojemudia has shown some signs, and this year's fourth round that Damari Mathis from Pitt is a talented, competitive as you know what son of a gun, and potential Cincinnati, where Eli Apple is trying to fend off the likes of Trey Flowers, second rounder Cam Taylor Britt from Nebraska, and potentially even first round Dax Hill from Michigan, if they think he can play on the outside. But let's move inside now with the battle for the Giants starting nickel spot where you got Darney Holmes, Cordell Flott, and Dean Belton competing for it. I like a lot of the stuff that Big Blue has done this offseason in terms of overhauling the coaching staff with Brian Dable and Mike Kafka running the offense, an aggressive defensive play calling with Martindale, getting the top two overall prospects on my personal draft board, and investing into an offensive line that has been one of the weakest units in the league for a while now. As I discussed them in the original draft breakdown of the NFC East, which you can find that video and every other division here on my YouTube channel, I wasn't a big fan of anything that they did beyond the first round of the draft, with some confusing additions in the secondary. With the release of now Eagle James Bradbury, they probably expect last year's third round pick Aaron Robinson to switch to the perimeter full time, 
after he was already third in snaps among cornerbacks inside and out for them last season 23 percent despite only appearing in nine games while they did recently restructure his contract the giants did spend 39 million dollars across three seasons for dory jackson after he was released by tennessee last year so he figures to be the other outside corner while logan ryan is now in tampa bay after splitting time between the slot and safety setting us up for an interesting freeman race for the starting nickel gig Danny Holmes was the guy I referenced along with Robinson at about a quarter of the defensive snaps last season, which he was able to log across 11 games. That actually presents a drop off from his rookie campaign, but considering the other pieces that they brought in, I'm not discouraged by that, since his coverage numbers actually improved despite seeing a higher depth of target, with only 6.5 yards per target, a pass rating of 71.9 surrendered, and a challenging position for young players, while only missing 2 of 31 tackling attempts. His issues at UCLA as a former 5-star recruit were the easy access that he granted in off-man and zone coverage, and his inability to work off blocks against the run, which is obviously required at that spot. Then we get the two rookies. Third rounder Cordell Flood from LSU is an extremely loose athlete who showed excellent growth when he moved into the slot last season. This guy has the speed to carry routes vertically with relative ease, he's light on his feet to redirect, and he shows good awareness in zone to make plays off his landmarks. While he features good height at 6 foot and a half, he's a super skinny 175 pounds and a subpar arm length and hand size. He does have the slipperiness to work around traffic, but when receivers are able to attack his chest, he has his issues disengaging from blocks. And while he probably has the natural talent to compete for snaps outside, his track record would indicate that he's better served to stay in the slots. A very different body type and player was selected by the G-Men around later in Iowa State Belton who basically was used as a big nickel and even dimebacker uh, for the Hawkeyes, where he would be lined up over the number two and three receiver mostly, but also moved into the box and had one of the usual linebackers pick up the motion man when they shifted the second level instead of having a trail across the formation. Belton has no issues punching at the chest of blockers or filling the C-gap and run support, while in the pass game he uses his leverage well and doesn't allow guys to cleanly release against it, along with having the size at 205 pounds to match up against tight ends. The concern with him is how protected he was in the system, with very few true one-on-one -on -one coverage reps, and the fact that he tends to come into hot as a tackler. So really, as we look at the candidates here, this depends very much on what they are asking from their position. Wink Martindale is notorious for having heavy pressure looks, where they would routinely send one more guy than the offense can protect against, and put the cover guys in some tough positions, if the pressure doesn't get on quickly. Holmes being able to stick with guys in man when he's allowed to put hands on them will translate well for that while flood speed would allow them to keep him there even if the other team puts a premier deep threat in that spot. While Belton presents a different dimension in terms of a guy who can play closer to the line of scrimmage, thanks to his size and physicality. My guess right now is that Holmes earns that starting gig, while flood steps into the role that Aaron Robinson had as a rookie kind of, where they use him inside and out as a backup, while Belton will also be competing for snaps at safety and as a big nickel against teams that use more two tight end sets or facilitate the pass game around those guys and want him disrupting them off the line. A few other spots where they are competing for playing time in the slots. The 49ers are looking for somebody to step up in place of K1 Williams, who signed as a free agent in Denver, like I already mentioned, with several veteran and second year candidates going to battle. The Falcons, depending on if they like what they saw from Isaiah Oliver in 4 games is a nickel enough to just hand him the job back, or maybe they want to put Richie Grant there, who shows some promise in limited capacity as a second round rookie or if they see him as more of a traditional safety this year. And the Cowboys big nickel or dime backer job, with Jaron Curse and Darren Wilson still there, but I'm also guessing that this was somewhat the plan with Israel Mokuamo as a late round pick from South Carolina last year, and they signed two undrafted free agents in that mold, who I like quite a bit in Georgia Tech's Wani Thomas and Florida A&M's Marquis Bell. And finally, we're analyzing the Rams' second safety spot, along with Jordan Fuller as the green dot guy for that unit with Taylor Rapp, Nick Scott and Quentin Lake competing. While the reigning Super Bowl champs did lose starting cornerback Darius Williams, and safety Eric Weddle probably isn't coming out of retirement again to help them out, the secondary as a whole is arguably more promising coming into 2022. They did bring back Troy Hill from Cleveland for a 5th round pick to man the slot. They hopefully have Jordan Fuller this time around if they're able to put together another playoff run, and they add some more young talent to that unit via the draft. I think that second outside cornerback spot is also still up for grabs, with mid-round picks from each of the last year draft competing for it, but I'm also more interested in how they split snaps for the other safety spots along with Jordan Fuller. Taylor Rapp seems to be the obvious answer here. I mean, he played damn near 96% of snaps in the regular season. The organization clearly values his ability to process the game and the toughness that he brings, or the lack of top and athletic traits that he may have. 
which he's repaid them for with solid play. And he did have four interceptions this past season. However, when you look at the pure coverage numbers, Nick Scott has him beaten completion percentage, yards per target, passer rating, and missed tackle rate. With Rapp surrounding four touchdowns on 58 targets, while Scott wasn't charged with any on 24 looks his way, and when Rapp was unavailable for in the postseason, until he played a little less than half the snaps in the Super Bowl, Scott really showed out, not missing a single defensive snap, while impressing with his tremendous range, particularly against the Bucks in the divisional round, he picked up a floater down the sideline from Tom Brady, and separated Gronk from the football later on, kind of a key for down I believe. He certainly made a case to take over that spot in my opinion. And I want to throw the name of fourth round pick uh, Quentin Lake from UCLA into the ring here, because he had some of the cleanest tape you will find from college safety. His ability to decipher route patterns, read body language with receivers, work of real and control fashion, and be a secure tackler, all make me believe he could be a solid contributor even if thrown out there early on. Although being the son of a former NFL Pro Bowler shows more in his advanced understanding of the game rather than his pure athletic gifts I would say. So while I believe Lake will likely be a backup early on at least, he can probably give them some solid snaps right away when needed. Rap vs Scott will be fascinating to track, because at this point the far more experienced among the two is Rap, but the seventh rounder from 2019 offers better range and may allow them to drop Jordan Fuller down as a robber or rat more regularly when they do rotate into single high coverages. So I could see a pretty even split between the two guys, but if I had to make the decision today personally, I would give myself the versatility in the back end with Scott to also be able to use Rap as a dimebacker and big nickel against tight ends, kind of as a plus plus here. Other safety battles that come to mind, who did the Bucks pair Antoine Winfield Jr. up with? Jordan Whitehead was a menace racing up the alley and driving on routes in front of him with playing quarters, but he's not with the Jets. So can Mike Edwards build on some of the big plays that he delivered as a number three safety? Is it Logan Ryan's job to lose with the absurdly low salary that he's getting this year in a wink wink type of deal maybe? And can Ken O'Neill cover out a role for himself after being listed as a linebacker in Dallas last season, playing even closer to the line of scrimmage? The 49ers are kind of in a similar situation with Rukowski Tart moving on free agency. Does the George Odom signing from the Colts entail a direct move to another veteran? Do you want to see more from Tal Noah Hofanga, who I looked at as a dimeback coming out of USC, but he was in ball magnet on special teams and defense in limited capacity as a mid-round rookie? And what does life look like for Tavares Moore after missing a year with a ruptured Achilles? And the Lions seem pretty seldom a starting duo of Tracy Walker and Deshaun Elliott, but who'll be the third safety on those sets? Did they like what Will Harris showed as a starter last year enough to put him there? Kirby Joseph is a promising mid-round pick with great size and range for it. Or do they maybe tap into a Fatum Lefanu as the type of tight end eraser maybe? That's something I'm also interested in. But that's gonna wrap it up for this one. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and feel free to share with a couple of friends desperate for football season to come back around, as I'll be keeping you posted with content like this all year long. Once again, I recently put out an NFC and AFC edition on the biggest roster needs for each team in the league right here on YouTube. Last week I analyzed all eight teams that finished last inside the division in 2021 and ranked up the likelihood of winning it this year. That's on my page for of Football Talk, which will be down in the description as well. And I got a big two-part piece underway on some second and third year NFL breakout candidates that I've already referenced a couple of times. So a lot of stuff already available and still to look forward to. There's already a video popping up at the top right corner for you to enjoy. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one. So until then, see you later. Peace.